uh, everything rises and falls on leadership and that organizations are looking for impactful leaders who can really transform our organizations and really create the space and the normalcy that leaders can make a huge difference within the context of our organizations. So at this point, without any further ado, I want to welcome and bring some folks to uh, the Zoom space that's going to give kind of a greeting, if you will. I want to first acknowledge our board chair, Attorney Damon Rutledge, who is joining us tonight. Uh, Attorney Rutledge, we want to appreciate and thank you for joining us for our first inaugural leadership development program uh, through the uh, Leadership Strategic Leadership Institute. And then next, I want to invite our Dean of the College of Business, uh, Dr. Donald Andrews, who will do a greeting for us tonight. Really have done a lot of heavy lifting in this space to ensure that we are here tonight and we're glad that Dean Andrews has had a really been a driving force behind this entire initiative. At this time, we're going to welcome Dean Andrews for a warm greeting at this point. Dean? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Jackson that we've been working on for quite a while. We recently received a $300,000 grant from the Economic Development Administration, which is basically partially funding this overall project. So just don't think we could have a better speaker tonight uh, than General Russell Honore. So he's gonna be our inaugural speaker, a Southern University graduate, a proud Southern University graduate. And so thank you very much for all of you joining us here tonight. Thank you, Ron. All right, thank you. At this point, I would like to bring on Dr. Ash, as we affectionately call, who is now the interim dean for the graduate school. Dr. Ash was the associate dean in the College of Business, as well as the MBA director. And Dr. Ash was very foundational you know, in my coming to the College of Business. He's the one who actually hired me uh, to be a professor uh, within the College of Business, the MBA program. At this point, I would like Dr. Ash to come and give us some greetings and some words about tonight's conversation. Dr. Ash, if you just unmute yourself. All right. Thank ben. you, Dr. Jackson. And uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's really an honor and uh, a great privilege to greet our first uh, cohort in this program. And uh, this is really a very unique program from the day it was conceived and seeing this fruition is really a great feeling. And uh, the topic, especially uh, strategic leadership at times of crisis is not only current, but extremely important issue for any organization, public, private, nonprofit, even individuals on our service is extremely unique. And the uniqueness also goes to the presenters uh, in this program. Uh, we have uh, Ambassador James Joseph, General Honore, uh, Dr. John Butler, Dr. Jackson. These are individuals whom I have really in the past attended most of their presentations and it has never been enough really. They are so dynamic, they are uh, thought leaders in this area to provide us really what is the concept of all leadership, not only in its general term, but as regards to also at times of crisis. Whenever we talk about leaders, okay, many things is come into, into uh, our mind. Leadership is nowadays becoming more and more critical for all organizations, really. It's becoming very, very important as uh, uh, economic, political, and all other environments, even climate is dynamically changing. The need for leadership is becoming extremely important. And I'm sure participants in this historic uh, uh, workshop or short course will benefit. And I'm personally really excited uh, to follow the program in general. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Great, thank you, Dr. Ash, for those uh, words. We really appreciate all of the heavy lifting that you've done in this regard, and you've certainly been a tremendous trooper and a heavy lifter to ensure that we be able to offer leadership to employees, to our staff, to our students throughout uh, our community. At this point in time, I would like to recognize the efforts of Chancellor John Pierre, the Chancellor for the Southern University Law Center, 
Dr. Pierre, uh, Chancellor Pierre has been a phenomenal individual that's really helped us again to do some heavy lifting in this space. So I would like to bring uh, Dr. Pierre, uh, Chancellor Pierre at this point, I want to call him doctor. He's a doctor of law, so a juris doctorate, but I want to bring uh, Chancellor Pierre to the uh, forefront and give Chancellor Pierre an opportunity to just share some brief words about tonight's uh, Leadership Institute and how he's been impactful in to ensure that our leaders are successful. Chancellor? Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Jack, evening. Dr. E. Glade, to Dr. Andrews, and to our the speaker tonight, General Honore. Uh, what an honor for me to be able to be involved in this, as well as uh, everyone from the Southern University Law Center, Ms. Marla Dixon, Ms. Jasmine Hunter, and everyone else. Uh, leadership is very important, especially now in today's society. And we have a model at the Law Center that we create lawyer leaders. So leadership is extremely important. It can be transformational. Not having the right leaders can be disastrous. So we join in uh, congratulating the College of Business for being the fire starter that brought us in and helped. We, we put a little gas on it and, and now it's a big flame and we, we really see this as a bright light uh, in, in a sustainable venture that we will all be proud of for many years. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chancellor. But certainly, leadership is important. I like what John Maxwell says when he talked about the 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. He says that we need leaders at every level within the context of our organizations. And organizations are spending billions of dollars developing leaders, coming up with leadership development programs to ensure that our leaders are successful. So at this point, without any further ado, I have one more individual that I would like to bring to the forefront, our board chairman, attorney Demorn Rutledge. And I would like uh, uh, the board chair, attorney Rutledge, just to say a greeting to us tonight because he was very uh, helpful in making sure that we were able to bring forth uh, this forum tonight, attorney Rutledge. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jackson. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andrews, Chancellor Pierre, Dr. Ash. And we are certainly excited uh, to hear from my dear friend, General Honore. Uh, I, I, please treat me as a student here. I have come only to learn. Uh, I appreciate the acknowledgement uh, and uh, look forward to the engagement. Uh, I'm certainly hopeful. I encourage the, our board at our meeting on Friday uh, uh, to uh, participate in this, looking forward to not only General Honore's presentation, but the others whom you have uh, lined up. So thank you very, very much uh, for the opportunity. Great. Thank you, Board Chair. At this point in time, we're going to do a very high-level introduction to the leadership framework. What I'm going to do right now is share my screen because we're in a virtual space. We have to move and twist and, and turn around just a little bit. So I'm going to share my screen, uh, if you will, and, and provide a context for uh, where we're going right now. All righty, let me get this screen shared here. One second. Writing. There we go. Let's let me share the screen. One second here. All right, here we come. We have multiple presenters. And so we're going to have to share multiple screens tonight. All right. There we go. Thank you for your patience as we get that up. All right, here we go. So, so the context tonight, folks, is what's the Strategic Leadership Development Institute? What is this all about? It's about, again, really helping leaders to be successful 
as I indicated before, organizations are spending billions of dollars to make sure that our leaders are impactful, that our leaders have the tools that they need to be successful. I've spent probably about the last 25 years as an executive coach, really doing the deep dive and the work to really help organizations to help their leaders to get the necessary tools that they need to be successful. So just some basic trends that's affecting leadership at this point in time that I thought would be very impactful for you and bring some clarity and really do just kind of codify what leadership is all about. And I'm sure that you in the audience in our virtual space could really appreciate some of the trends that's affecting leadership in today's 21st century. I like this concept here about 75 percent. Uh, employers report that leadership, uh, that, that, that 75% of employers report that bad bosses are the most stressful part of the job. I'm sure many of you can relate to that, having worked for individuals that perhaps have not been the best bosses and not been the best leaders. So those are some trends that's trending out here. This is another uh, uh, analytic that's out here. 71% of organizations say their leaders are not ready to lead for the future. So how do we begin to reshape this trend to make sure that our leaders that are in the pipeline and not only the ones that are emerging leaders that's in the pipeline, but what about those leaders that are currently uh, leading others? How do we ensure as the leadership trends begin to shift to more empathic leaders, more empathetic leaders, more leaders who can certainly create energy and synergy among our organizations. 71% of the organizations says their leaders are not ready to lead for the future. Another interesting trend here is that 54% of organizations do not have successors for critical leadership roles. That's alarming to me. When I think about succession planning, when I think about making sure that, that intellectual knowledge and institutional capital don't leave out the door, that as an organization that we're taking a very concerted effort to harness that knowledge, to ensure that our leaders are successful, that we pair them up, team them up, and make sure that those leaders uh, are pouring into the upcoming leaders, that we have a defined individual leadership development plan, that we have those crucial check-in periods, those crucial conversations that leaders need to have with those individuals within the context of their organization to ensure that we have a successful transition of power. All right, another trend here, about 89% of organizations say leaders uh, leadership is uh, at the top and it's, it's not a really oppressing problem. Say leadership uh, is not a really oppressing problem, but I want you to know that that is just a myth. We definitely have to make sure that we, again, are being intentional around developing our leaders. We're being intentional around creating the context that our leaders have the best tools, they have the best resources, that they're growing. And then what's really trending is making sure that our leaders have individual leadership development plans. And that plan is a very concerted plan. It lists what the individual strengths are, their developmental opportunities are, and it really guides the leader into being intentional around development and growth. All right, another trend here. About 81% of those leaders that were surveyed through Brandon Hall said about 81% that leaders are not affected at developing other leaders. That's a amazing trend. So we have organizations that are growing, but about 81% of those leaders indicate they're not affected at uh, developing other leaders. So I like what John Maxwell says. He says, it takes a leader to know a leader, to grow a leader, to show a leader. And it's, in, it's very important that we have, again, that concerted leadership development program that really dive into developmental uh, tactics and developmental trends to ensure that our organizations are successful. We need individuals that are really concerted and, and intentional around helping leaders to grow. All right, here's another stat. 19% of those leaders believe that learning and development today is relevant and is a key issue. It is a huge issue that we are, again, intentionally growing, intentionally allowing our leaders to provide the tools, the resources, and, and the traits that they need to be successful within the context of our organization. This is another trend that I think is very alarming. 90% of corporate organizations have a leadership and learning and development program. So if we have 
learning and development programs and we have leadership development programs. I think it's crucial that we align them to organizational goals, organizational theories, organizational practices to ensure that we have in that pipeline tonight, ladies and gentlemen, individuals who can move the needle within the context of our organization. But look at this last trend. Only 5% of those leaders have a leadership development plan. That's alluring to me. So are we being intentional around growing those leaders? Because the, the new millennial group and the new millennial age, and I have kids within this, within this space, want to come in uh, one day and be uh, hired. And then two weeks from now, they want to be senior leaders within the context of their organization. How many of you know that it doesn't happen that fast, that it takes a concerted effort, that it takes a concerted plan? I like the law of process that John, John Maxwell says. He says leadership doesn't develop in a day. It develops daily. It's within the context of our daily agenda that will determine if we're going to be effective within the leadership space. So as you can see, there are some trends that are affecting leadership that we as an institution, we as organizational leaders have to really pay attention to and that we're really being impactful and changing the dynamics within our organization. Now, if you want to look at what's really trending and really is happening in our workforce, there's this concept called VUCA. There's a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity within the, within the context of our organization. As you can see, there, there's a huge changing demographic within the context of our organization. There's a lot of globalization. Technology is changing. We're able to provide this leadership forum via Zoom tonight. So we, we're seeing that technology is definitely being enhanced. You have Teams platforms, you have Slack platform. There's so many platforms that we're able to enhance and grow our leaders even from a distant space. As you can see within the context, there's a lot of volatility in terms of staff reductions uh, as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic and crisis. So organizations are having to be smarter. Organizations are having to do more with less. There, there is this whole concept tonight, ladies and gentlemen, of a shortage of skilled workers. So organizations are having to upskill, organizations are having the right skill to ensure that their workplaces are successful. When you think about Walmart and some of those other organizations, they're really doing an empathic job to ensure that their workforce is successful. So lastly, there are about four generations of individuals within the workplace. So how do we begin to bridge those dynamics? How do we make sure that there is alignment? How do we make sure that we take our uh, generation Xers and align them with the baby boomers to ensure that that intellectual knowledge is transported within the context of our organization? So some of the other changes that's taking place within the context of our workplaces, look at work relationships. We're moving now from that old command and control, defined silos and formal structure to more a team-based approach. When you think about the work that I do within organization, it's very synergistic. It's very team-based. There are more flatter organizations. There are more collaborations and influence within the context of our organizations. So organizations are really having to really come up with new ways and new ideas. Idea. They're really folks having to reimagine today's 21st century workplace. Who would have thought that uh, in March that our workplaces will have to do remote work? How do we still increase productivity? How do we ensure that our employees are safe? How do we create that psychological safety that employees need? to still have high levels of productivity. One of the organizations that I've been following that's doing a fantastic job in this area is Chick-fil-A. And I like Mark Miller. At Chick-fil-A, Mark Miller is the Vice President of Leadership Development. One of the things that Miller purports at Chick-fil-A that makes that organization so successful, he says in order to have high productive workplaces, we need high performance leaders. If you're going to have a high performance organization, we have to make sure that our leaders are high performing and that organizations are investing in their leaders. They're investing in their leaders on a daily basis to ensure that the leaders have the tools that they need to be successful. One of the challenges that Chick-fil-A has uh, within the context of that organization is to have a, the workforce of 
of millennials and high school kids who basically are looking for a summer job or looking for a after school job. But they're saying regardless of what title or how old the individual is or whatever that individual's age is, that individual is adding value to our organizations. How do we make sure that that individual is engaged? How do we make sure that that individual is aligned? So when our customer comes and, and that customer experience, regardless of whatever the age of that individual is, we want to ensure at Chick-fil-A that that customer experience is on target each and every time. But in order to ensure that customer experience being on target, we have to make sure that our leaders are on target. We have to make sure that our leaders are engaged. Folks, do you realize that about 70% of our workplaces today are disengaged, our employees? So that says about one out of about seven out of 10 employees who show up for work really are not at work. So how can we have high performing organizations when seven out of 10 people who show up for work really are not at work? So our work is very impactful within the context of our organization. We have to create that energy. We have to create that synergy. We have to create those plans to ensure that our workplaces are successful and that our leaders are successful. Let's go to the next slide. So in VUCA time, times of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, there needs to be a new skill set of leader skills. So in order to meet the demands of the 21st century workplace, we need leaders who are versatile. We need leaders who are aware of themselves. I like what uh, John Maxwell says. He says, it takes a leader to know a leader, to grow a leader, to show a leader. And I like the concept of what Daniel Goldman talks about in emotional intelligence. What really makes a leader? What is the construct of making leaders successful? So in emotional intelligence, Daniel Goldman says, it uh, what makes a leader? It requires high levels of emotional intelligence. He calls it the sine qua non the sine qua non, which is a necessary ingredient. Emotional intelligence is a necessary ingredient. So he says the leader that is aware of himself is the leader that can regulate himself. So it's not just myself being aware of my emotions, but how my emotions impact others within my leadership organization. So leaders have to have a lot of versatility, a lot of openness, a lot of compassion. So the new concept today, ladies and gentlemen, is psychological safety. Are we creating workplaces where individuals are free to come and express themselves? Do we create the context within our workplaces that people can come and speak up? We need leaders who are versatile. And then next, we need leaders who are understanding. I like what Stephen Covey says. He says, seek to understand in the seven habits of highly effective people, then be understood. So we need leaders within our organizations who are understanding, understanding that this pandemic has upended our workplaces, understand that this pandemic has upended the lives of people. So we need to have a little bit more compassion we need to have a little bit more sympathy. We need to have a little bit more understanding of what employees are going through. We have to make sure that we are still connected to our workplace. Again, that next word is connection. So one of the hallmarks that Mark Miller talked about at Chick-fil-A is he calls it the care model. I want to ask the question to you leaders tonight. Do you care about your employees? And if you do, how do you show care? How do you demonstrate care? Do, do your employees feel that they can come and share their difficulties or their concerns? Or when they are not doing uh, uh, meeting expectations, is, is the environment safe enough to, for them to come and say, well, I, did, I missed that deadline or I didn't get that report done in a timely manner? Are we creating the psychological safety that employees need? to be transparent. I like what Brene Brown says. She says that transparency and vulnerability, there is no triumph without vulnerability. So we're talking about adding in the 21st century organization tools and skills and behaviors like vulnerability and compassion and care to our workplace to ensure that our employees are successful. We need leaders who understand themselves. And when we get leaders who understand themselves, they can bring the organization on to the next level. And then we need leaders who are agile, that can move back and forth, that, that are able to be adaptable, that can move towards change. So the 21st century organization has significantly changed. I spent a lot of time working in, in my coaching practice with leaders 
who have employees that sometimes are not connected, that, that are indifferent, employees who are not aligned to organizational goals, we as organizational leaders have to create that psychologically safe space and zone to bring those employees along with us. One of the organizations I had some time to do some work with, we did an employee engagement survey. And not only did we engage whether or not employees were on board, but we did an enablement survey as well. So we took the responsibility and said, it is just not up to the employee to make sure that they are engaged, that we as organizational leaders, we took ownership, that we wanted to make sure that we provided the necessary tools for our employees to be engaged. So we said, do you have the necessary tools? Do you have the necessary resources? Do you have the necessary goals in line to create that partnership to ensure that our organizations are successful? All right, so here's the deal. The last part of my presentation tonight from an overarching perspective, leadership is everyone's business. So we need leadership today, ladies and gentlemen, at every level within our organization, not just at the top brass. We need leaders regardless of what their job titles are. We need everyone within the organization feeling that they are a leader, that they're playing a leadership role. Leadership is everyone's business. Leadership is about relationships. The best leaders are the leaders who cultivate successful relationship. And successful relationship tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a giving experience. It's amazing to me that people want to be leaders, but they say they don't like people. I don't think that anyone's going to ever be successful as a leader who are not growing as a leader within the context of relationship. It's all about relationships. It's about, so I like what Maxwell says. He says, leadership is not about position. It's about my disposition. It's my natural outlook towards others and my natural outlook towards people. Successful leaders are very impactful and they are able to manage and cultivate great relationships. It's about self-development tonight, folks. It's about providing the tools that you need to be successful, understanding your strengths and what those developmental opportunities are and really intentionally developing a coaching framework and developing yourself to ensure that you're meeting those organizational goals. The next thing about leadership tonight, gentlemen, and ladies, it's learned. You can learn to be an effective leader. Leadership can be learned. It's a set of traits. It's a set of skills. It's a set of abilities that can be learned. I can teach you how to be an effective leader. I certainly can. So the old school said, well, you, either you have it or you don't. So the proverbial language is, are leaders born or are they made? I say they are both. There are some individuals who have natural traits, natural leadership abilities, but for those who perhaps may not have honed in or came with those types of traits or ability, we can teach you how to be an effective leader. And then lastly, leadership is an ongoing process. It's, it's a journey. We never arrive. We're lifelong learners, and we certainly want to create the context that our leaders are successful. So that's an overarching view of what leadership is all about. We're in the practice of helping our leaders to be successful and providing them with the tools and the resources that they need to be successful. Just to uh, leadership, according to Jacuzzi's and, and Posner, it says leadership is the art of mobilizing others who want to struggle for shared aspiration. So when you want to think about what is that true definition of how do we get others to move to the level where they need to go and to be all in and really uh, celebrate and take ownership of our organizational culture, to take ownership of our organizational uh, behaviors. It's about mobilizing others. It's about helping people to be all in and to take the ownership that they need to be successful within our organizations. I want to just outline two of the five practices of exemplary leadership. The first practice is model the way. So we as leaders, we model the way. I, I, I just want to again, shout out to Chairman Rutledge for modeling the way. He's the chairman of the board of supervisors and immediately got on to what we were talking about in terms of this leadership institute. He's modeling the way. He's creating the capacity. He is all in. He's modeling through his personal values that leadership is important at every level within our organization, within our institution. So we need all leaders to be on board, to take ownership, to find your voice so you can help others to find their voices. And then in that process, ladies and gentlemen, we affirm shared values. There is an alignment. There's congruence of our values. So whatever your values are within the context of the leadership space, you help others to 
identify what their values are. And then the next aspect of leadership challenge is leaders inspire a shared vision. Notice that it is a shared vision. If you want to fail, don't bring others along with you. But when you're a leader, you're able to create uh, ennobling possibilities. You get people to see what the future looks like and getting them to bring their energy and get on board. And you aspire them through a list of common visions that really help people to understand what it takes to move the organization forward. Within this context, ladies and gentlemen, we are creating a new leadership dynamic at Southern University between the Southern University Law Center and the College of Business. We are being intentional around leadership development. We're being intentional around coaching. We're being intentional around creating emotional intelligence. We're being intentional around creating teams. So Harvard Business Review is doing some research now that really predicts the success of teams. Would you like to know what is that number one predictor of team success? It, it is tonight, ladies and gentlemen, it's communication. Teams who communicate effectively without any hesitancy are teams that are successful. So we have to come and create that psychologically safe environment that we're able to communicate where the team members are. So when I think about the five dysfunctions of teams by Patrick Lisiani, he says the absence of trust which is the foundation of team success, precludes teams from being successful. So how do we eliminate the distrustful behaviors, the distrustful attitudes? We create that psychologically safe environment that people are free to be vulnerable, that they're free to be transparent, that they're free to share their ideas. Leaders do that by enabling others to act. All right, so here's some key learnings tonight from my presentation. Leadership is everyone's business. We need leaders at every aspect of our organization. We need board leaders. We need uh, uh, instructor leaders. We need administrative leaders. We need HR leaders. We need leaders at every aspect of our organization. We don't leave anyone out because everyone has the capacity. Everyone has the ability to be a change agent within our organization. Leadership development is about self development. It's about developing yourself, understanding. I like what Peter Drucker says, in the knowledge economy, success comes to those who can manage oneself. And in order to manage oneself, it requires a, a lot of self-awareness. It's being able to understand the things that I do well, the things that I don't do well. What are those developmental opportunities for me? Who do I need to share? with? Who can I connect with? What are those successes for me within the context of my organization? Again, leadership is a set of, set of skills and abilities that can be learned. We can coach you. We can help you. We can teach you to be a, a successful leader. And then lastly, leadership development is not an event. It is an ongoing process. Ladies and gentlemen, it starts tonight within this virtual leadership forum. We are unpacking, we're codifying the importance of what it takes to be a successful leader. And I'm very passionate about this work. I'm very passionate to help individuals grow. I'm very passionate as a professor when I hear students tell me, Dr. Jackson, uh, you've helped me to move forward. You help me to understand the context of my leadership ability. Now I can go and I can create my own value proposition to help me to move to the next level within the context of our organizations. That's what this Leadership Institute is all about, folks. It's about leadership development. It's about organizational change, helping individuals to change because change is not change, ladies and gentlemen, until it's changed. It's about collaboration. It's about team development. It's about synergy. It's about strategy. The, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts from a strategic perspective. We have a lot planned for you within these uh, seven weeks. The speakers are going to do a fantastic job. We want you to sit back, take your notes, get ready for this journey of leadership. And I guarantee you, your life won't be the same after this seven weeks. So let's move forward. Let's be all in. Let's come with that leadership energy. Let's be impactful. Let's move forward so, so that we can change the dynamics of our organizations. All right. I'll stop sharing there. All right. So what I want to do now is shift to our next aspect of tonight's presentation. We're going to be uh, 
very grateful and very uh, pleased that General Honore will be presenting tonight, the new normal within the context of the leadership. Uh, I remember when Hurricane Katrina hit and I was uh, looking at some of the news reports in New Orleans and when General Honore was dispatched to New Orleans, he brought clarity to chaos. That's what we do as organizational leaders. We bring clarity to chaos. And General Honore did a very impactful job at really creating the dynamic for what it took to take charge. Leaders take charge. And he was able, able to allow individuals within the context of his space to really understand what it took. It was a shared vision. He couldn't do it by himself. He was able to impact the lives of so many people when they were in distress, when they were in crisis. So at this point in time, I want to share this brief video uh, about General Honore's journey at this point in time and bear with us because this is a virtual environment, but let me go ahead and share this video with you at this point. All right, let me share. And it's gonna really tell the story about the challenges that General Honore had and how he was able to be impactful and how he was able to rally the troops literally together to come up with a seamless operation that really, again, brought clarity to chaos. Here we go. This new task force that is being established to deal with Katrina, who, who will be in charge? Who will run this operation? A one-star, a two-star, a three-star, or a four-star general? Our understanding at this point, Wolf, and the announcement is not officially out yet, is it will be a three-star army general. It will be this is a complex problem. It's called a disaster. Look up the meaning in the, of a disaster. Friday, September 2nd, four days after Katrina hit, the cavalry has arrived. Hey, weapons down! Weapons down, damn it! Put the weapons down! Uh, all I have to say this morning is uh, hooray for Honore. This guy uh, seems to be the perfect guy for this job. Seeing him in the streets of New Orleans, telling them to put their M16s down, for gosh sakes. And, you know, just, you know, let's get some tension out of here. Let a little steam off, please. You know, you saw Honoré yesterday doing really sort of almost symbolic things. But uh, at one point, our Barbara Starr, who was uh, right along there with him, uh, witnessed him come up to a mother who had twin uh, babies, and she was struggling to even hold on to them. And he took the babies out of her arms, uh, gave them to his soldiers, and arranged for them to immediately be medevac uh, to a ship offshore. Now, that's just one person. But what it, it sends a message that they understand uh, the problem. Of course, the whole his whole point about having the soldiers put their guns down, uh, to, again, reinforce that they're here to help. They're not here to, uh, you know, intimidate people. Well, I'll tell you where blame doesn't lie, and that's where the straight shoot and take charge John Wayne dude who never got stuck on stupid. He was exactly what the Gulf Coast needed right after Hurricane Katrina. Don't get stuck on stupid, reporters. That's BS. I will take that on behalf of every first responder down there. It's BS. That's right. We'll never forget General Russell Honore's one-liners, but we'll remember what he did for the hurricane victims even more. When President Bush assigned this Louisiana-born general to command Joint Task Force Katrina, Honore knew this would be one of the most difficult missions in his career, but he was ready. And he became an overnight hero. All righty, folks. This new task force that is being... All right, let me unshare that screen here. And I want to bring up General Honoré's presentation. Just give me a second. We're in a, a virtual space, so I have to change and get his PowerPoint. One second there. There we go. Let me share the screen for General. And the next voice that you hear will be General Honore. General? <laughs> Just make sure he's not muted here. Okay, General? Oh, 
I'm sorry, folks. Let me get him unmuted. He's still muted just for a second. We're in the General, can you unmute yourself? There we go. There you go, General. You can go ahead. You unmuted at this point. Well, thank you, Dr. Robinson. That was uh, a fine introduction to the topic of the day, uh, dealing with leadership and uh, strategy during crisis situations. Again, I want to thank the uh, leadership at uh, Southern University, Dr. Andrews, Dr. Pierre, and uh, Barrister uh, DeMoen Rutledge, our system uh, board chair, for making this opportunity possible for us to come together and dialogue. Your uh, enthusiastic uh, introduction there uh, did a good cover of uh, what we were saying in the Army, uh, some basic doctrine about leadership. And I do think it's always good to reflect on what that doctrine is. Uh, in the military, we have a field manual on leadership. We have a field manual on uh, leader development that is resource, and we establish our careers around leader development. And in recent uh, years, we've added something since I left the Army called talent management. Getting the right people in the right job at the right time so they will be the future leaders of your organization. Uh, to reflect, to segue from what your comments were about the role of the leader, one of my observations, I don't read Maxwell that much or Covey, but I wrote two books on leadership. One, Don't Get Stuff on Stupid, and the other one, Leadership in the New Mormon. And unlike Covey, this is stuff I did. He liked to talk about what other people did, and uh, he does a good job of it, and this is called Survival. Uh, how do we... Uh, create a culture of preparedness in America. But from that excellent review of doctrine that uh, you shared with us, sir, I'd like to share with the group that uh, a one-liner that I think the world is looking for, the space where you live and work, and even in your home, people are looking for leaders. They're looking for who's going to take the lead. Because normally the person that accepts whether it's a formal or informal leadership role, they're going to end up with most of the work. So people are looking for leaders. And we've got to take in the context of people. My understanding of people from 37 years, three months and three days in the Army, commanding everything from a platoon to an Army that had 500,000 men and women in it in all 50 states that we led an influence is that the people that work with you can generally be described as three groups. There are people uh, in the bottom tier, if I may refer to them as that, they're working on one thing, an exit strategy. And what they do between breakfast and lunch is figure out where they're going to lunch and where they want to go work next. Because this job is a, generally a paycheck. And if you don't recognize that, you, uh, you won't be right-sizing your organization. And then there's a group of people in the middle. They don't necessarily want to be the leader. They want to be good employees. They want to make sure the bureaucratic process works. They want to make sure the reports are there on time. They want to make sure state and federal compliances are met. And the other thing they want, they want to be left to hell alone. They want to do their job. And they're in the middle. And then there's 10%. You'll recognize them because they laugh at all your jokes. You know why? They want your damn job. They want your job. Uh, and you don't have to convince them to motivate them. As I said, they laugh at your bad jokes, even. 
Why? Because they want to be like you and they want that position. And that is a blessing, those three groups of people. Because you know what? You can't run the organization uh, with everybody as the leader. The aspiration is everybody is a leader in what they do. Particularly that middle group, uh, they understand if being a leader is doing the harder right over the easier wrong. It's making sure that we're meeting our objectives and our goals of the organization and that they put in a full day's work. But at the end of the day, they want to go home. They don't want necessarily to get a promotion and working in a global company and say, next month you got to go to Seattle, removing you. They want to be left to hell alone. They just want to do their job and do their life work there. Many of them because of family situations. And a lot of them is because things go, else things going on in their life. Elderly parents or people that they have to see about. But when the clock hit five, they're ready to go home. And right now in the virtual world, many of them are home. So taking that into consideration, I think people are looking to add something else to Dr. Robinson's uh, toolkit, people are looking for leaders. Uh, when I grew up in Lakeland, Louisiana, not far from Southern University, right up the river at a place called Point Compete Parish, Lakeland, Louisiana, I used to go over with my friends that I went to uh, elementary and high school with over in, uh, on a sugar plantation. Uh, it's a one lane road that goes through this uh, quarter where the folks live who worked on the plantation. And an observation I'd like to share with you was uh, we'd be shooting marbles and uh, everybody had a dog in the yard. That was, your, uh, that was your ADT watch system back in the day. Uh, everybody had a farm dog <coughs> in the yard. And we'd be shooting marbles and all of a sudden one of the dogs would take off after a rabbit. And upon that bark, that lead dog would start running. And by the time it got to the end of the row of houses on the front end of a sugarcane patch, guess what? Every dog out there was following that lead dog. They never saw the rabbit, but the lead dog was barking, and they believed there was a rabbit there. At some point in time, they stopped running because they never saw the rabbit and the rabbit kept going and the lead dog stopped. I say that to tell you as a metaphor <coughs> that people are looking for leaders to lead and looking for leaders in the organization. And if you take that metaphor, the following dogs never saw the rabbit. But the fact that the lead dog was barking and headed in that direction, everybody followed. And organizations will follow the leader and the direction of the leader. The challenge of the leader is to make sure you're barking about the right thing, that you're repeating the message what is really important to the organization at the time with the resources you have, and with the mission you have. So I ask you to take that metaphor into consideration. I think people are looking for leaders, and they're looking for the boss, whoever that might be. What is the boss barking about? Because the boss ought to be barking, if I may use that metaphor, about what's important to the organization. You know, if you go into the staff meeting, and the, uh, what becomes the center point of the meeting is not profit and, and loss, but the focus on the staff meeting is uh, how many of y'all are going to attend the, the, uh, the gala we're having to support a fundraising, or how many of y'all are going to uh, help, us, help us come clean up uh, 
some civic engagement in the town, uh, we can send mixed messages because people are going to respond to what the lead is barking about, speaking about, repeating, being repetitive about. So that piece about leadership, I hope you will keep in perspective because people are looking for the leader. The other thing about leadership is to differentiate the difference between leadership and management. The key element I think to be distinguished as a leader is to have a clear understanding that to lead, you're gonna to have to sacrifice. Yeah, I said that word sacrifice, if you're going to lead. And to lead, you're going to have to accept criticism. Because the key function of leadership is developing and creating change for what the organization needs. Whether that's growth, whether it's a change in direction, whether it's adapt and overcome. You see, management can be successful at throwing up the pie charts and they've done their job. That's the management piece. Leadership, as Dr. Robinson eloquently said, is adjusting and correcting that vision about setting the goals and about establishing the objectives. Dr. Robinson, if you would go to the next slide, please. By the way, old Robinson did a good job, didn't it? That was a good job on that opening presentation there. Dr. Robinson, you still there? Next slide. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm still here. Next All slide, right. please. I'll get it for you. Now, he didn't have that problem changing his slides, did he? <laughs> the next slide that's coming up uh, speak to strategy as we go to that segue to that part of the discussion it's imperative that we take a good look many times in organizations when we used to have these real world off sites and we would have uh uh, these, what we'd call retreats, leader retreats, or in many places, how do we find a good excuse to go to a nice result and play golf, <laughs> uh, type meetings. Much of the energy was centered around a discussion of strategy. And I remember being asked to come over to Coca-Cola company in Atlanta. Much of that leadership has changed. So I will use that as an example. And Coke had brought together uh, some international leaders who were merging a brand together. And uh, they put together a task force from every department that came together to figure out the strategy uh, for merging the, a new brand into the mother brand, Coke. And uh, they spent much of the first hour or so uh, with a discussion of uh, the goals. Uh, what I found missing in that a bunch of educated people from some of the finest universities. The gap I found, it wasn't necessarily the vision because I think in a strategy, you have to have a clear vision of what you want to do uh, and your aims. But if you don't have your strategy right, because a lot of folks still think strategy is what we're going to do big down the road as opposed to what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it now. A relevant strategy to the environment you're in, which means the strategy has to be updated based on 
your current SWOT analysis of what's happening in the organization. You know, if you were to be operating with the same strategy uh, that you had prior to February, before we went into the COVID environment, then I would say you need to go back and look at your strategy. Because the SWOT analysis will tell you uh, your organization has certain strengths now that they didn't have before the COVID. There are certain weaknesses that exist because of the COVID, particularly if you're in a high contact business. If you have graduate students that are running a heat and air conditioned business, if you have doctors or nurses, uh, that's kind of a contact business. They've got to go out and meet people in order to perform their functions. It's not a virtual uh, operation. It's like we say, our chief of staff in the army said recently, we cannot fight a war virtually. We have to train and learn how to operate that create opportunities. Just as this entire experience, and even with COVID-19 has created opportunities and it's taken opportunities from us, it's a threat. So looking at your strategy, now you may add other things to that SWOT analysis, uh, terms that are relevant to your strategy, but where I think many folks fall short in my observation, as it was with Coke, uh, they sort of ended their discussion with the vision and the goals. And there wasn't a full understanding of the objectives. Now, folks, I've probably done 15 to 20 Fortune 100 or 500 com companies looking at their strategy. Where I saw the biggest shortfalls that I'd like to share with you and for you to use this as a tune-up list to go look at your strategy is look at what's under objectives. Uh, the objectives, this chart normally falls short because from the goals and visions under objectives, we need to have a clear understanding of what we're going to do. What are we going to do? The next thing is who's going to do it? It's like creating, you can almost put it on a, on a matrix chart. Who, who is going to do it? Because if you don't identify who's going to do it and we're going to do it, guess what? It won't get done. Who is going to do the things that make this vision and this goal? Everybody is not the answer. The next is, when are we going to do it? When are we going to get started? Which means when, you can put a slash marks next to when and put the word time. How long are we going to do this? What is the trigger point of when we stop doing this? When are we going to do it? We can't operate between board meetings. Too many companies operate between damn board meetings. Business happens every day. I talked to a company today in Washington. I called them up and they're COVID compliant. And the an answer machine come on that we're, we work from nine to five summertime. They didn't even update the phone message. If you want to speak to someone, uh, type their name in on the phone. Well, you know what? I didn't grow up typing names in using the keypad on the phone. So the guy's name is Geasley. G, where's the G? Where's the H? Did I spell his name right? One of the most frustrating experiences I've had recently. Okay? They've got a last century phone system. If I wanted to call them 
to get a speaker, to ask them about uh, a consultant, you're not going to stay on the phone with a last century phone system. It ain't going to happen. So after I spoke with the gentleman afterwards, I said, look, you, you lose in business. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you got an antiquated phone system. How people are going to call you in the COVID environment with an old phone system from last century, something you might have heard in 1995, telling people to hit a button. You know what I like? I'm talking about how you adjust. When I call my airline, you know what they tell me, Dean Andrews? Hello, Russell. Welcome back. <laughs> they say, hello, Russell. Welcome back. We're busy right now. We'll call you back in a few minutes. And it's all automated. It's an AI-driven program. So when we get into our objectives of how we're going to operate in a crisis environment, this what, who, and when, and how, and now you get to the hardest thing on this list on the objective is how you going to do it. Are you going to do it with more? Are you going to do it with less? Are you going to use a lead team to do it? It's like these football coaches. Uh, we had a bad Louisiana weekend in football so far. And speaking of that, y'all must be some blessed individual because there's a football game on tonight. Might be one of the games of the season. And I'll get you out of here in a few minutes to go enjoy the rest of that. But how are we going to do it? When I spoke to that group at Cope, they had no idea of how to execute the tasks that needed to be done to do this merge. And you know what, Dean Andrews? They didn't want to talk about the how. Because the how is one of the hardest things, is how are we going to do this? Who's going to put this sweat equity in how, and who's going to be the leader of how? Collectively, we can describe, decide what and who, and we can collectively decide when, but when it comes to the how, that takes a dedicated leadership team to make the strategy work. And again, most of those I have seen has a very little energy put into how we're going to do things. The next thing is I put the dollar sign, but you're going to need resources to execute the strategy. You can't execute, continue to execute more with less. You can execute it differently. But if you're serious about making the strategy work, you're going to have to put some money against it. You're going to need resources. You know, most, res most strategies don't get executed because we never figure out how we're going to do it. We never figure out who was going to do it. And we never had a budget for it. If you don't budget for your strategy, don't expect it to work. You've met the role of what the consultant told you. You filled out the sheet, but you're not going to have it work. you got a budget for your strategy. Even if you've got to stop doing something else. You know, one of the lessons of, uh, I learned on Southern Campus, one of the instructors told us is, uh, and that's a long time ago because I left at 71, uh, I took an ag economics course. I didn't like that professor, but he was good. And he said, uh, you have to control growth. So Henry Ford, you remember he went from the Model T or Model E or whatever that sequence was. He kept going. And finally, he told his team, he said, look, we got to control growth. For every new car you bring, you want to build, team, you have to tell me what you're going to stop building. Because you can't continue to grow the organization and continue to do the things you may have been doing in the past and the way you were doing them. You have to control growth. 
if you don't control growth, you're going to be carrying baggages that are not inside the current profit margin, that are not inside the, the, the current norms of technology. It's like my speakers bureau phone system. They got a last century phone system. So how are you going to do that? You need to budget it. You know what the agent told me? He said, well, you know, we cut back on money during the COVID because we work in virtual. But people contact you through the phone, bud. <laughs> That's how people call you. You got an antiquated phone system. I tell CEOs all the time at these conventions, borrow your buddy's phone and call your office right now and see what response you get. Tell them, demand that you want to talk to you and see what the hell happens. You call your office using the person next to your phone and demand to speak to you and see what happens. You've got the budget for the change you want to make. And in the case of this company that I was coaching today that I work with and some might say for sometime, uh, when they adjusted for the COVID and they told people to stay home, they were able to reduce their budget because they don't need as many office buildings anymore. But that came with somebody say, well, we'll just use the phone recorder to deal with the public. Wrong Amundo. No, 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 no. <laughs> that is your segue into the public when people call. Yeah, they can go online, but uh, a lot of the boomers are still making the decision. They want to pick up the phone and talk to somebody and hear a voice and tell you what, tell you what they want. They're the customers. And then the last piece, Dean Andrews, that you and I have talked about before when we talked about leisure, how do we measure success? Because if we are not measuring where we are going, then we're not going to know when we get there. Because that's probably going to precipitate change. We're going to have to change. If we accomplish our goal and we've achieved the mission. Because this is not a straight line list. If you took this list, the proper way to display it would be in a circle, Dr. Robinson. Because it's a continuous process of reassessing your vision, your goals, your objectives. You know, when Gates was building uh, Microsoft, oh, one of the one-liners he put out there is, you know, the world and the Congress work on a 12-month calendar, but we work on a three-month calendar. Because uh, every three months, somebody's caught up with what we're doing. So we're constantly putting out 0 0.23, a 4.5, 4.2, you're in a constant state of change if you're going to lead. And I don't think we could continue to operate what we see right now in this COVID environment on a 12-month calendar. We got the 12-month budget, but I don't think the 12-month calendar is going to work in terms of creating that budget that starts in whether it's July or in September and it's still relevant by next February because too much is going to change. You know, we got uh, 150 million instant tests is supposed to be released. And I've been on television everywhere yelling about instant tests for 90 days. We got 150 million. I think we need uh, 300 million a month to get the job done. That, that is what it's going to take to suppress the virus. But they threw a political objective out there as opposed to an objective that meets the how you want to suppress the virus. So how do we adjust that strategy? The old model was working 
Once the budget is out, that's what we're going to do this year. How many of you started your budget last year, and how did that change after COVID hit in February and in March? Some businesses actually grew during COVID. Businesses up and running. Other businesses have almost suppressed. And the ones I worry about, Dean Andrews, that I hope you and I can have a virtual cup of coffee, is how we're going to help the small businesses because they're in a survival mode. You know, when you talk about a disaster and you take Lake Charles, we need to outreach to Lake Charles. Why? Because 40% of those businesses are going to fail. We know that. They're going to fail. They're either going to open too early or they don't have the capital to open or they're going to open too late. If they don't have the capital to open, many of them are going to take that SBA loan, which will give them up to $250,000. They open too early? What do you mean open it too early? The, the people are not back. The customers are not there. So you reopen your, you take an SBA loan and you reopen your shop, whether it's a barbershop uh, or whether it's a, a mechanic shop. And if the people are not back, we saw it happen in New Orleans, Dean Andrews. People came back, they took the SBA loan, they opened their business, and within three months they were broke. Why? Because the customer base hadn't come back. We learned that lesson, Dean Andrews. We learned it in New Orleans, and we learned it in the 2016 flood. That reopening of those small businesses, because they hire 70% of the employees. One of the projects we might can work on as a side project with the extension service is how do we help coach those small businesses to come back and the timing of when they come back. Because again, if they come back too early, the customer base is not there. If they come back too late, other businesses have opened to fill that gap. And let me tell you something, people like to go to the new stores. If all you did was patch it and threw some bleach and threw a uh, some mold remedy in there, when you open back up, you better look new. This storm gave you opportunity to rebuild. If all you did was patch that glass out front with a piece of tape, guess what? Across the street, one of them corporate stores are going to open up. They're all new. They got new bathrooms. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Just look at North Baton Rouge where there's new big gas stations moved in. You know what I'm talking about, Dean Andrews? Yes. Do people stop at the old ones anymore? They might stop there for a certain product, but a lot of those businesses are closing. Because the corporates came in during the reset because they got a tax break. The dilemma and how we help shape that space in Louisiana, because we've had so many experiences with it, Katrina, Gustav, 2016 flood, and now Lake Charles, Cameron, uh, uh, Burgard Parish, on up to Allen and Alexandria. I think there's a place we can do a quick uh, seminar there uh, between you and Dr. Pierre and the Ag Center to, to capture that knowledge. And then how we integrate that in through this medium of Zoom and share that knowledge with those business leaders. 40% will fail. Now think about that. When you have a business, a small business, the entire, the successful ones, the entire family are affected by a family with a business. Y'all agree with that? I mean, when you're doing service, when you're in the service business, helping, doing things for other people, whether you're selling tires or you're cooking or you uh, selling a corner store or you're selling furniture, the entire family benefit from that business. And when that business fail, when we talk about leadership in a time of crisis, those businesses don't have the, the, the 
intellectual uh, background of a Dr. Robinson who shared with us tonight the challenges of leadership because to them, they don't necessarily look at this from an academic perspective. They're looking at it from how can I get back to where I was before the disaster hit? And they were hit with two disasters. First, the COVID affected their business, right? Before the COVID, 25% of the people in Lake Charles tested positive. Then the uh, hurricane came, Laura, and 100% of them were without power. They just returned to power last week. About 95% of people have power. And the water is now drinkable. So those businesses are going to struggle to be able to survive because when the business fails, the small business, it's not just that business, it's the whole family get affected. And I think that's a space that we can beat Harvard on. We can beat the Warden School because they don't know a damn thing about this. You with me? But those small businesses still hire 60 to 70 percent of the people in America. This is a space we can uh, participate in. Because when you look at your SWAT in the university, even though we're in a crisis, there are opportunities popping up. There are opportunities to do things. There's an opportunity to growth and reach and to, to, to share knowledge. And then there's still threats because we still got the problem with COVID. We got the problem with a challenging market and we got a problem with future storms. We got, we just halfway through the hurricane season. So if you hurry up right now and you reset and you take that 255 mile SBA loan and you fix your store up, and you say, well, I'm going to hurry up and get it. I want to be the first one back. And everybody's going to know out here when people move back, they'll come here. And this is where they're going to get their hardware supplies or whatever it might be. We could have a, two more storms by the end of storm season. Then where are you then? So I think that's why the SWOT analysis, and I think the SWOT analysis need to look at that strategy, the vision, the goals, the objectives, and the how and the when we're doing things as far as time, that need to be at least reviewed uh, every 60 days. So let me take a look at time for the night. It's about 7.20. I have a lot more content, but I want to... Uh, Go to the next slide. This will be the next slide for the night. I'm going to talk to this about 10 minutes. And then we'll go to a little dialogue. And then we'll get out of here and go catch the best half of the game, the last half of the game. Is that a deal? Yes, sir. That sounds great. Thank you. In the true, true spirit of an adjunct professor, we're going to be in and out of here. We're going to get what we need to get done, and then we're going to be gone. So... I do think the fundamental challenge of businesses, and if I may speak to it from the perspective of small business, is the fundamental challenge of doing the routine things well. Is how do we handle that customer? Uh, during the COVID crisis, I I'm going to stores, some of them are national brands, you know, you go, you, you want to be a good soldier. You, you put your mask on, uh, you go in the store and the store has put up a plexiglass. And then you see a couple walk in, they don't have a mask on and they're almost walking in like they got an attitude, you know, just tell me something. You know what I mean? If that store employee don't challenge them, you know what I do? I take that stuff and I set it on the counter and I walk out. I leave. Because I don't have to buy your stuff. If you're not going to enforce the rules, 
then I'll leave. And you know, there's a lot of talk about we're putting employees at risk. But you know what? The stores that just tell folks, hey, you have to have a mask to come in. A lot of times people do it and they just forgot. They go back in the car, or the clerk will hand them a mask and they go about their business, by and large. How do we do the routine things well? Because I can tell you, uh, I will share with you that some of the most, some of the biggest crises, unlike Katrina, are incidents I had to deal with as a commander, particularly over in Korea, operating with 20,000 troops along the demilitarized zone for two years with 100 helicopters and weapons that could reach Pyongyang uh, and 150 tanks and about 18,000 infantrymen with artillery. Uh, that was a high risk environment. And where our biggest disappointments were the failures we have is that it was a failure in somebody doing the routine thing well. We had an incident where one of the worst incidents we had was that of a, a armored vehicle ran over and killed two young girls, 12 years old, in the middle of the day. And uh, it was one of the most uh, emotional events because I have two daughters. And that event was then taken through the transition from the old Republic of South Korea to the new Republic of South Korea. They used that to recalibrate uh, U.S.-South Korea relationship, that one incident. And they even, we even got charged with intentionally doing it. I mean, I've got 20,000 troops there that are taken from their families and sent to South Korea one year at a time. Myself and my leadership were there for two years at a time. But when we went in and said, how did the accident happen? Well, they were on a vehicle that the Army has been having for over 30 years. And the inception of that vehicle had blind spots on it. So they flew in the people from the National Safety Organization in the United States. They flew to Korea and they stood there and they looked at the vehicle. They recreate the accidents. And you know what they told us? Well, there's blind spot between the driver and the assistant driver. There's parts that they can't see on the ground. So I said, okay, get the training manual out. Is that anywhere in the training manual? Guess what, Dean Andrews? It wasn't. It wasn't. We have technology that could have fixed that 10 years before it happened. We could have put a camera system on there. We didn't collectively as an army. But the failure to do that one routine thing well, and making sure the soldiers were trained about that blind spot, we strained a U.S.-Korean relationship for nearly a year because they used it to exploit the, 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 the accident and uh, getting concessions from the U.S. on our diploma. So uh, the other thing is the type of accidents. You know, uh, when we do physical works out on the job, like uh, – the chairman of the board of the Southern uh, board, I have people out on jobs uh, and a person lose an arm, that's a lot of money. And the fact that person has lost an arm, but that's a lot, a lot, a lot of drama for an organization. That can, that can define actually the profit of the organization for a year or more if a person loses a body part. And many times that's because someone failed to do the routine things well. So I can't overemphasize that. I'm going to backtrack on that a little bit next week. 
the next piece I want you to think about until we meet again is don't be afraid of the impossible. I speak about that in uh, this book, Leadership in the New Normal. Because when we look at the future and our current strategy and what's next for us, there's a big next out there, folks, that's coming in about 10 years. And that is the transition from 10, from seven to 10 billion people in the world. It's going to change everything. We, our ag department over there, the Southern Ag, they got to get with it. We're going to have to produce 40% more food when we go from 7 to 10 billion people. Why? The numbers don't work out there, Honoré. The numbers are 7 to 10. Well, let me tell you why. Because 30% of the foods we do produce go to waste. First of all, we need a strategy. Well, how are we going to stop wasted food that we are growing? And then how are we going to create enough food for that expanding population? Because you know what? If people are hungry, they're unsettled. They want to migrate. They want to move because they want to go to places where people are not worried about food, that you can get all you want to eat. So as business people, we need to have an impossible list, Barrister Des Moines. What is an impossible, what is your impossible list in your company? Things that if somebody told you today, the, in many cases, people say, well, that's impossible. We can't do that. Because that's the future. That's the list we've got to embrace. Things that we can visualize that are impossible today that we're going to have to do. Why? Because the expanding global population is going to force us to do it. I came to the Southern in 2008 and set out on the bluff and with the then chancellor, and we were talking about challenges of budgets and everything. I said, there's your money. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, you're on the Mississippi River. You got to figure out how do you turn within that river into gold? <laughs> Your money is in that river. How do you become the best at cleaning that river water? Why? Because only 1% of the water in the world is drinkable. And if we can master through businesses and engineering and technology, how to clean that water and clean it properly and clean it at the best price, guess what? We'll be able to ship that water to California. You with me? And people say, ship water to California? We ship oil there every day. Where do you think PG&E with 22 million customers in California get their gas from? They get it out of Cameron Parish, Louisiana. Out of a big old pipe that pumps 24 hours a day. Water is money. How, and I told Chancellor at the time, at several uh uh, leadership changes before. I said the, the, the money is right there in that river. How do we take what's in that river and turn that into money through research and development? How do we take that problem that has been created because what flows through that river ends up in the Gulf of Mexico and it's created a 6,000 mile dead zone? because the river is full of protein. How do we capture some of that protein out of that river that's flowing from cornfields in the Midwest and from sewer systems uh, out of Missouri and turn that into to, to money? And you know that a lot of people say, well, that's impossible. That's why we want the impossible list 
because we don't have an option going to seven to 10 million people. The world is not giving us more land. Matter of fact, we're going to have less land. And the world's not going to give us more water because we're having more droughts. We're going to have to embrace doing things that many think are impossible. The last piece as a leader is don't be afraid to act. Uh, many leaders fail to act because they're worried about being criticized. You know, leadership is not a popularity contact, uh, is not a, a popularity contest. It's a performance driven event. Now, I'm not saying leaders ought to make it a habit of going around uh, creating change just for the hell of it. But I can say this, if you're not changing, Dr. Robinson, for your next set of slides, you can say, I already said this. If you are not changing, you're falling behind. And people don't like to change. Do they? People don't like to change. All right, free your hands up for a minute. We're going to do a little exercise. I hadn't done this virtual before, but play along with me. Yes, sir. I'm going to give you an Army-style command. And you can unmute everybody if you want, Dr. Robinson. Give an Army-style command and like everybody to participate. And the HR people, don't worry. I won't hurt anybody and I won't... <laughs> Won't embarrass anybody. Everybody ready for the command? Yes, sir. Ready. Cross your arms now. So it looked like everybody got that done. They got their arms crossed. Now, how'd you feel about that? You ought to feel pretty good. You're hugging your favorite person. You. <laughs> yes, sir. Now I want you to look down. And I want you to switch arms. Put the other arm on top. Look down and put the other arm on top. Okay, Mr. John got that one. We're good. Now, admit it. It feels different, doesn't it? Uncomfortable. Relax. Give yourself a big round of applause. You've done good on that. <laughs> People don't like change. Because intuitively, you got a certain way you're going to do this. Uh, one of the parts of it, I gave you instructions. So I told you when I wanted you to do it, right? And then I got into some how. I wanted you to look down. Because suddenly said, I don't need to look down, general, to cross up. No, that was part of the instructions. Look down and put the other arm on top. People don't like to be told. And as a leader, you have that unpopular responsibility that comes with a lot of satisfaction of telling people what to do and when to do it. This is not an all, well, y'all go figure it out. There are places for that kind of leadership. And it's called kindergarten. <laughs> it's called Boy Scouts. When we have people's lives at stake, when people depend on us to solve some of these hard problems, somebody and people are looking for that leader. They're looking for that dog that's barking. Why, Dr. Jackson? They're going to follow that dog that's barking, right? Yes, sir. So regardless who sets in the CEO desk, the dog that barking is the one that people are going to follow. And they sometimes will follow them. They'll never see the rabbit because they, the dog that's barking don't have a clear vision of where they're going. And that's all I got to say about that tonight. Great. I got a few minutes for dialogue. Yes, sir. So and if you have I any... I don't want to abruptly end, but I'll segue in our next session from where we are now. Great, thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate those uh, 
wholesome instructions on how to be effective leaders in crisis. You've definitely rolled out a plan, a strategy, an opportunity for us. So we appreciate your wisdom. We appreciate your knowledge. And you've done a very impactful job in providing us with the tools and the resources that we need to think critically when we're in times of crisis. So at this point, if you have any questions, you can actually you put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. But I do have a question. Dr. Jones has two questions for us tonight, uh, General. And the first question is, when is the best, uh, just want to roll there, uh, when is the best time to implement a risk analysis during a strategic model process? I'll say that again. When is the best time to implement a risk analysis during the, the strategic model process? A risk analysis is a continuous process. Okay, all right. And then the uh, next- I'm just saying this from an operational perspective, uh, not strictly from an academic environment, but from an environment where you've got people with machinery and stuff moving, risk is a continuous process. Because you know why? If you think about the Atlanta ice storm, look how stupid we looked as a nation. First of all, we built all the interstate to go through the town because the greatest generation, as great as they were when we put the interstate system on, they all had the idea that the interstate needed to go through town, kind of like Baton Rouge, right? We, we want them trucks to come through here, so they stop and we sell them some gas, <laughs> whatever else, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. Uh, they were the greatest generation, did a lot of things good, but they didn't do that one right. So the weatherman in Atlanta talked for three days. There's an ice storm coming, right? So we got trucks with precious cargo on board, right? Everything from baby powder to steaks to computers, right? To parts for bullets for the Army. All of them coming to Atlanta. Atlanta got 17 Fortune 500 companies. It has the world's busiest airport. After all that tart and warning. Guess what happened? We got airplanes got stuck in the air because the mother man said the ice is coming tonight. The airplane take off Chicago but they can't land. What in the hell were those CEOs thinking about? <laughs> Hello? You know what happened if one of those planes go down? They were so stupid, they told the drivers to keep moving and they ended up parked in Atlanta for three days on the damn interstate. So don't tell me nothing about that Harvard-driven business model. You with me? They don't yes, know what sir. the hell they doing. Because risk assessment is a 24-hour-a-day operation. It's not something you do at the board meeting, and it's done. How did we end up with BP, fellas and ladies? We ended up with BP because we had a management cell in Houston from a global corporation that said, we spend an $800 million a day. We want to complete this project. We had people on the platform said, we need to stop because we're at risk. And one of the contractors said, my job here is to force this out, and we're going to do it. When they went back to the CEO, one of the most dangerous part of the operation was to put the cap on the well. And they asked the CEO, where were you doing this operation? You know what he said? I didn't even know it was happening. If you don't know what is happening, one of the most dangerous operations you do when you're doing a well, put the cap on the head, what in the hell else was more important to you, CEO? <laughs> you with me, folks? Yes, sir. And it created one of the most devastating impacts we've had in the Gulf. The CEO said he didn't know it was happening. So when we go from boardroom to C-suite, weather will make you change your risk assessment. 
if you think about risk assessment from how the stock market like you, that's the easy part of your business. How do you keep 50 trucks from being stuck in Atlanta? How do you keep an airplane from nose diving because we flew it in bad weather? How do we not blow a, a wellhead in the Gulf and become hated by the world because we didn't know, we did not manage that risk? You with me, folks? Yes, sir. How does that leadership at Southern who said, hey, football is good, but we're going to pause and we're going to do that at a later time? You with me? Yes, so sir. You're always doing risk. <clears throat> It's not just based on the market and the sweet C-suite job. It is who we've got out doing what, who's at a high risk. Because I'll tell you what, one of your trucks go out there and run over somebody. If you're in the distribution business, if you like Mr. Des Moines there and he got a, a delivery truck taking something down to a Thibodeau and they hit a car with a family in it, we're not talking about a couple million dollars, folks. And then we're talking about a bunch of people that might be injured or what? Or even killed. This is going to be more than a blimp on the profit margin, even if you have insurance. Because you'll never get your reputation back. People will remember who that truck belonged to. I, I hope that makes sense in the term of risk. Because too often we think about risk of, of a markets, and uh, dollar valuations, but the biggest risk we face is when we lose people's lives or we destroy a piece of the environment. And, and we all participate in that. So I think risk uh, assessment is a continuous process. We tell our soldiers, you do a risk assessment uh, at least three times a day. If you got a hundred soldiers marching up a hill uh, and it's going to take all day to get to the top, uh, how fast you can go is going to be different in the morning at six o'clock when they're fresh. It's going to be different at 12 o'clock in the middle of the day with 90 degree heat. You might have to adjust how fast you go and how often you take breaks. Because if you don't, by two o'clock, what's going to be happening there? Captain Dixon, you're going to be calling in medevac, right? We're losing some folks. Right. So you do your risk assessment throughout the course of the day. That's my tell you. Over in Lake Charles, we had the hurricane coming. You know what? Some of those 12 refineries over there, some of them never shut down. Guess what happened? They were talking about tidal surf. They had a 184-mile-an-hour wind. You know how many of them stacks probably broke? Ask lawyer Pierre, he'll tell you, because that's going to end up in court. You with me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're in a constant state of risk assessment. Great. That was very impactful and very deliberate, General. Thank you for your response. I have one other question from Dr. Jones as well. The next question is, what is the best way to generate funding for strategic projects that were not originally funded? Okay. I don't know the best way, but I know a way. <laughs> and you go back to that Henry Ford mom. Tell me what we can stop doing that's not added value anymore. We're doing it because of tradition. Because okay. everything got to be treated like a business, right? So yes, what sir. are we doing that's not posturing us for future growth? And sometimes we just got to worry about sustaining the status quo. We're not talking about growing. We're just talking about uh, surviving. How do we go through a survival period and you need money to do what you need to do. Hey, I grew up on a farm. Dr. Andrews' father-in-law was my ag teacher. When we needed tires for the tractor, we didn't go to the bank. We went into the feedlot, and we caught two calves and went sell them. You with me? <laughs> so sometimes you have to shed yourself of 
one thing to create the change you need to move forward with. There's some things you can't continue to do. I know, you know, a lot of mid-sized universities, don't say I'm starting no rumor here, uh, <laughs> went through a lot of challenges with budgets, and I was dealing with one of them, and uh, we deal with, that school dealt with underserved students and adult students. And we looked around and said, okay, let's look where the money is going. And a lot of the money was going to sports. Hmm. How many people involved with the sports program? We got three, 4,000 students. Well, we got about 20 in track and we got about another 20 in basketball. How much is that costing? That was 20% of the damn budget. Hello? Maybe we ought not be in sports. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean, a, a lot of that is right in itself, but I'm telling you, you we, we've got to, at the end of the day, we have to perform our core mission. And sometime you have to figure out, like Henry Ford, if we're going to grow and create a way to harness the water out of the Mississippi River, to be a leader in cyber, to be a leader in business development, we got to figure out some of the things we not going to do in the future that we're doing now. Because they're last century and there are people that do that better than us. You with me? Yes, sir. So how do we move forward? And, and that's a, a continuous cycle for businesses to deal with. And institutions are businesses. Institutions provide a service. So we don't expect Southern or any institution to make a profit. They're providing a service. But that service has to be reliable and it has to be relevant. It has to be relevant to the needs of the people. And, and, I, and I'll pause there, and not to sound like I'm preaching. That was, that was very good and very impactful, gentlemen. We always love your feedback and your response to our questions. At this point, Chairman Rutledge has a question that he would like to ask at this time. Chairman Rutledge. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, and thank you, uh, General Honor, a very frank presentation as usual, and uh, I think people come to expect no less. I read where uh, there are uh, approximately 1.3, 1.4 million uh, uh, people or enlisted men and women in the military, and of that number, there are only 900 of whom are either general officers or flag officers, which represents less than 1%. Uh, I don't know of any other profession uh, that we equate leadership with than a person who reaches the highest levels, either general officer or flag officer in the in general officer in the Army or flag officer in, I believe, the Navy. If you had to point to three things uh, that were most impactful on your ability to join uh, uh, such an elite uh, a group of, of men and women, what would they be? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I, uh, I've done a couple graduations up at Southern since I became a general. And every time I've done it, one of the lieutenants who just got pinned on, and he walked up to me and said, uh, General, how I become a general? <laughs> it, it never fails. I mean, his bars are still wet. He said, now how I become a general? <laughs> and... Uh, 
my advice to him is this, and I think I can use it in, 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 in this perspective. And your question is, uh, I said, don't focus on being the general. Focus, number one, on being the best platoon leader. Being the best at the job you have now. Focus on the hard jobs. If you're looking for easy, well, you don't have to work all weekend in that job. <laughs> you get to go home at five, and you ain't got to travel. So I want that job. The system has to has a way of rewarding people who work hard and work smart. You with me? Not the person who are looking for the job that uh, I don't have to do a whole lot of sacrificing for. You with me? And the other part I, I tell the lieutenant, I said, uh, young man, young lady, don't let nobody outwork you. I know that's old agrarian attitude of Booker T. Washington and the Washington Du Bois uh, a controversy of how do we build our people for the future, but history still remain a great legacy in how we move forward. Because both of them in their debate, they had a different approach to how we move uh, people forward in this world. And you know what? That debate continues today. Whether you look at it from a hand up or a hand out, uh, how do we build equity? How do we, again, when I tell these young people, I tell both of my sons, both of them in the Army, I tell both of my daughters, both of them are VP in uh, uh, Internet Marketing Company, don't let nobody outwork you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jackson, can I have a one follow-up question? Absolutely, Chairman. Go right ahead. This may be unfair, but you can handle it. Is there a is there a, provided that you can talk about it? If it's not, uh, classified, but is there a decision you made uh, in your leadership capacity on your way up to becoming Lieutenant General, or even as Lieutenant General? Uh, that if you had it to do over, you'd, be, you'd make a different decision? And why? I think why, I think my most, um, maybe a couple of things. Uh, my boss used to call me because when he gave it, a mission to the 1st Brigade of the 3rd Infantry Division, it got done. I'm going to say that one more time. If something was unscheduled, if it was out of cycle, if it appeared we are going to have people working more than they should work it, he called me. I think there was a time where maybe I should have uh, said, we need to back off with stressing the force a little bit. You need to give somebody else a chance. I didn't do that because I cherished the, the honor that he called me. He called my brigade. which created the op-tempo. So we went back-to-back -back missions. Uh, when I took over my brigade, was the brigade of 5,000 troops. Uh, the first mission, uh, we went out to a, a, a national training center where we got evaluated. Uh, within two weeks of doing that, I got back and uh, he said, I need somebody to do this. We need to fly up a brigade, a, a battalion to Fort Bragg. This is a short notice. It's cold in Georgia and North Carolina. We put those tanks on C-17 aircraft, 
flew him out in the middle of the night. We get back, and I start seeing some stress in my captains, the planners, the operators, let alone the privates. And we had a problem with drinking, and uh, we'd have 25 DUIs a, a month. We led the division in DUIs. We did more than everybody else, but we were drinking like fools. Uh, and then I created a draconian program that says, uh, if somebody from your unit get caught with a DUI, then that alpha company commanded first sergeant, the next night you're going to man what we call a blue goose. That any soldier who felt like they had too much to drink in the brigade would call that number and that first sergeant and that captain would go pick them up. And your company would have that mission until the next company got a DUI. Well, guess what? It took about a month, and the sergeants figured it out to have their soldiers call them as opposed to getting in their cars and driving, and we solved that problem. That was a Dacronian approach to solving a problem. And as a result of doing that, that same boss called me and said, Russ, the inspector general said, um, you're taking troops out to the field if there's a DUI and that <laughs> they're locked in for three days and they can't go home. I said, sir, in a month, we've gone from 30 DUIs down to like two. We did it in a month. He said, Russ, uh, the inspector general think you might be uh, employing some illegal leadership, mass punishment. I said, sir, we've gone from 30 DUIs to two. And I think some of those draconian methods to get people to change along the way created a reputation that if I had to do it over again, I would reconsider the draconian approach to solve problems. But the first guy to get promoted out of the group I was with was me. <laughs> <laughs> so I got rewarded for getting things done. That reputation of getting things done probably kept me from making four star. Mm. And, and I can live with that. I don't wake up in the morning and cry and say, boy, I wish I had made four star. Because I, I believe in that Sinatra song. I did it my way. And I enjoyed the hell out of it. <laughs> because and I enjoyed the fact that somebody said Honore you do it and, and when Katrina hit uh, I tried to go to Iraq and take over command of a division I even tried to take over Abu Ghraib you know the prison they had all that trouble with and I was pissed that I didn't get that job I mean I was mad I wanted to take over Abu Ghraib I said I'll clean that damn mess up so they picked another guy, a West Point guy that they wanted to promote early to three star. They sent him over, and he almost went to jail. But I would have cleaned that mess up. But there were people that said, you know, if we send him to Iraq, the next thing you know, they're going to want to give him a core, and the next thing he's going to be in front of some of the West Point guys, and he'll be up for four star. But – Got the damn job done. Same thing in Katrina. When it came out of Katrina, there are a lot of officers telling me, we know the president's going to promote you. Well, you know what? It's not up to the president to promote me. It's fellow general officers who work in a network that determine who the four stars are going to be. And then Rumsfeld said, we're going to have something good for you, General. You just were very proud of what you've done. Then Rumsfeld got fired. And he wasn't an easy guy to work with because nobody liked him either. So when he got fired and Gates came in, 
I didn't have a hell in chance when the Obama administration came in to get promoted, but that's all right. I can get out of a taxi in New York and some dude in the front of the Marriott Hotel with a West African accent, you know what he'll tell me? And I said, hello. He said, stuck on stupid. You that stuck on stupid man. I swear to God, it happened around the world. <laughs> so uh, I think if you try to do the right thing and you – get a habit of mission accomplishment, there will always see, be somebody in the organization that is superior to, to you. And, and that ought not drive people. I think mission accomplishment, when I came out of the second infantry division, I created more generals in the army than any other general in my time. I had nine brigade commanders, seven of them made general. Nobody else in the Army had done that. None of them. So I say that to tell you, I hope that kind of answered your question, but, but I do think I would have changed, I should have changed my style a little bit to be, uh, but, you know, I, I use adult language a little bit. <laughs> it's, it's a city of the fine way and when I was down there in New Orleans a lot of retired generals they didn't like that they were sending word back said what the hell is general doing uh, using damn on television and I said you know what what army were they in did they ever listen to a conversation between MacArthur and uh, Bradley and between Bradley and, uh, and uh, Patton <laughs> You know, they got this television view of how Eisenhower talked. Uh, this is uh, this this is the army. You know, this is you want to ask people to do something tonight. They're not going to be here tomorrow. They never they'll never hold their mama's hand again. Some of them will never see their babies. And when you're out there leading troops as we were on the streets of New Orleans, this is not like. Uh, a pile of land in a plane on a clear day in New Orleans. You've been in a, a turbulent <laughs> plane landing, right? When everything's smooth, the pilot say, uh, we are going now, folks. Uh, we ought to be on the round about five minutes. If you land in the turbulent weather, the junior pilot come on and you can holler at, ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, stay stocked in here, we got it up here. Everything's going to be just all right. In the meantime, you're puking your damn guts out. So, that's what it is like on the ground. You got to get the answer. Somebody knows how can you find that person and how can you adapt and overcome. I appreciate y'all patience tonight. And I, I defer to you, Dr. Robinson, if there's another question. I think yes. we're all the time. Yes, sir. We have just two more. And one of the things I want to reflect back on a comment that uh, Chancellor Pierre said early at the outset of this conversation was the Southern University Law Center was developing lawyer leaders. One of the things that we want to pride ourselves in developing in the College of Business, we're, we are developing self-aware leaders. So I have a question from one of our MBA students, and it's uh, around vulnerability. But the question for you, uh, General, is uh, what would you say is your weakness or what are your weaknesses? So Brene Brown really talks about there is truly no triumph without vulnerability and that in order for leaders to create the path forward for followers, that there's a level of vulnerability that we all must embrace as leaders. So what would you say would be or how would you classify your weaknesses or a Remember weakness. to say no. <laughs> <laughs> when you get shit done, everybody wants you to do it. I mean, sometimes you got to say no. And in your core task, excuse my language, I, I, I didn't mean that, but that, that show you my weakness. That show you why I'm not. <laughs> but sometimes you just got to say no. Uh, I'm, I'm putting my shirt on to come up here. Someone sent me a text. I said, there's a lady in Lake Charles. This is her address. She's 65 years old. Uh, she's, uh, she's come out of a house a few times. She's fallen over this limb that needs to be cut. So I'm sitting here as we doing this, 
directing their search and rescue team in. Now this lady can talk. She's talking to a lady in Baton Rouge. And I'm saying, well, why is she talking to the first responders in Lake Charles? So I can't get into all of that, right? So just as we started the rescue team, when you were giving your update, Dr. Jackson, the rescue team had arrived and there was a dog barking, keeping them from going in to the property. Now, in my old age of 73, I get a lot of satisfaction in helping solve the problem. The thing we have to worry about is when people stop calling you. As long as the calls are coming, people are putting demand on your time, that's a blessing. Because if you ever go through one of these periods and nobody's calling you, there's something wrong. And more likely there's something is wrong with that person you're looking at in the mirror. So, but I still haven't had, how do I say no? The multiple requests for interviews in the course of a day. Uh, young writers are working on uh, graduate work. I always try to find space to uh, them with research papers to, to give them something. There are people who are complaining about pollution. Uh, I mean, it goes on and on. But, but I do have a habit of not saying no often enough. And as a result of that, I don't necessarily spend as much time with my grandkids. But as I tell my daughter, you know, we, we moved 25 times. And when you guys were growing up, we figured out how to raise you. And we think we did a pretty good job. So don't have any damn expectation that my job is to take grandkids to school. That is not my damn job. My job is to find that lady out there that need a rescue team to come get her, right? right. You take care of your own children. And, and I hope I'll leave a, a big enough estate where y'all be better off than I am, but take your own kids to school and pick them up. Y'all figure that stuff out. I did it, we did it, and we did it on one income. You with me? Because the biggest responsibility we have, and I don't want to start on it now because it's taking me a little while to get to it, is to save our best leadership for when we get home. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. We have another question uh, around the COVID-19 pandemic. And the question is, how feasible is it to continue reopening businesses if the positivity rate continues to spike upward? If you're over 5%, you should not be opening. Nothing. If you're over 5% positive and you're testing and you have to test enough of your population. Uh, what we had happened in the last few weeks and you know, I'm not a public health person. I've been working with a team from Harvard for months. We, we started back in February talking about testing called TTSI, uh, testing, tracing, and supported isolation out of Harvard Public Health. And we're working with uh, Senator Kasky to try and get testing, get the use the Defense Production Act. And just today, the White House finally announced a rapid test. We've been having rapid tests available since April. April! It, it's pretty discouraging. So what we have to do and to make that adjustment is to do what we do in business, optimize technology. Make it, in my second interview in late February, I did one with Fox News, believe it or not. I do go in there every now and then. And I said, the COVID test is going to have to be like the pregnancy test. Why? Because the American culture, we don't want to go for that shit. We don't want to fool around and have people knowing our business. We don't want to miss work. We don't want to be inconvenienced. You ready? It has to be because we are, we are a nation 
that has done the most creative work in the modern world of business because we have been driven through creation and innovation. And some of the brightest minds in the world have come here and created that innovation. And much of it is driven by, we want instant solutions. We don't want to wait for nothing. And some of the frustrations I had down in New Orleans was, people said, you don't have the people out of there yet? What's wrong with you, General? This would be some reporter uh, standing up there who's living in a hotel down in New Orleans, working by four hours a day. You don't know what you're doing? Why you ain't got the people out of here yet? Well, I could take time and explain it to you. The river is closed. The airport's closed. 80% of the river's under, uh, city's underwater. We got to de, uh, we got to clean the airport so airplanes can land more than one airplane at a time. And we're going to use buses initially to drive people out of New Orleans. Well, we got airplanes, we got boats. I'm going to explain to you one more time. The river is closed. It's got barges turned over. We're not stupid. Well, we got the airport out here. Let me explain to you one more time. The navigational aids on the goddamn airport are broke. We got to fly some in so when jets are coming in, they can see the airport at night. Let me explain it to you one more time. We're not stupid. So when we get that capacity, which we went from that capacity from Wednesday morning when I arrived to Saturday morning, we got the airport open. And just a quick lesson in how do we deal with this. Sometime in the crisis, you got to figure out what rules you're going to break. Because the rules were designed for normal operation. Now, this White House, they get a little too good at breaking damn rules. But, I mean, there's some you need to break because they don't work. You know what I mean? They don't work. I've dealt with the CDC during the SARS crisis, and, and they, they were too slow. They're the best in the world. But it, So you got to break some rules. The rule I'll break that I'll share with you right quick. Saturday morning, we get the people to the uh, New Orleans airport, and the first group of people get on the airplane, and they're happy as heck to get on that airplane. So I get a call from my uh, officer. I'm about to get on a helicopter in Mississippi and fly back to New Orleans. And he said, sir, I just had the TSA guy come up to me and said, uh, we got to stop operations because they didn't bring enough people in from Atlanta to run the airport all day. I said, oh, boy. So it goes back to that mission and vision. When I saw the little guy who rode around the blue airplane the day before from Texas, he looked at me and he said, look, cowboy, I'd never been referred to as a cowboy like <laughs> when I was a three-star general. And you know who I'm talking about. Look, cowboy, you get these people out of here. Whatever it takes, you do it. You understand? And he looked around the table at the governor, the secretary of Homeland Defense. Uh, the attorney general was there that day. All around the table, two senators from Louisiana, Here's a Southern University glass of 71 getting the finger from the most powerful man in the world. Whatever it takes, you get the people out of there. You understand? Okay. So at that moment, when that GS-15 from GSA, TSA said, we're going to stop the evacuation <laughs> because we don't have enough people with wands to check people for weapons, I knew I could win this argument. I would call my boss in Colorado. He would find the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Defense to find the Secretary of Homeland Security. He would call the TSA and the FAA because what we want to have to do to comply with what this TSA guy wanted to do was to bring more people in, bring in computers so we could create a manifest and we could use post 9-11 inspection standards because that's what the check lady is working on we got to check everybody for weapons before you get on the airplane hey man this is evacuation these people been standing outside for a week we're not going to wait another day because again i could win that argument it would take three to four to five hours <coughs> 
in the time I'm winning that argument, Anderson Cooper was going to show up. And he's going to say, why the people ain't leaving on the airplane? Well, Anderson don't talk that heavy. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> John Lee, would you tell us uh, why the airplane stopped flying? Well, we, we had a little hookup. We didn't bring enough people in from the TSA, and we didn't have a way to make a manifest. You know how damn stupid we'd be looking right, right then? <laughs> the most powerful nation in the world. And I just went back. That's why vision is so important from the leader. The vision from my boss was you get the people out of there, cowboy, and you do what you got to do to get it done. And that's what leaders do to empower the people that's going to do it to make the decisions that need to be made. <coughs> and I told that TSA guy, uh, we put him on a Blackberry. That was the term of reference. That's what we loved in Blackberry back then. Put the speaker on, got him in a room, and he explained to me the post 9-11 rules, which I knew pretty good, and said he was going to have to shut the operation down. I said, look, let me tell you something. We're going to fly these airplanes out of here. We're not waiting for you to bring any more TSA agents in. And we ain't creating no damn manifest. What are we going to create a manifest? What are we going to pull it from? You know where? It ain't happening. We're loading these airplanes. Do you understand? We're loading these damn airplanes. And there was a pause. And I heard what I wanted to hear. His little boy voice said, yes, sir. <laughs> You take responsibility. You're damn right I take responsibility. I love the damn airplanes. And that did not become a headline news that night, that we stopped the evacuation. Because you remember that sometime that lead dog, he's seen the rabbit, right? And people are looking for the dog that's barking that's going to tell them where to go, when to go. And that's the damn job of the leader. And sometime that leader, the leader is going to take rest. Nobody take responsibility and risk like the leader. It's like the lead dog and a sled dog team. You see the musher pushing the dogs. Nobody will have the glory of seeing the sun first like the lead dog. But nobody will take the risk to hit the bear trap first or to be hit by a snake like the lead dog. It comes with much reward and much glory. It comes with much risk. Great. Thank you, General. Got one last question for you tonight. Uh, and this last question is from Mr. Philip Cruz. And his question is, do active generals ever call retired generals for advice or a different point of view? Oh, uh, yeah, that happens frequently. It happens frequently, and uh, many times it's the other way around, where the retired general's calling them and said, hey, don't screw this up. <laughs> <laughs> because we deal by custom and tradition. It just so happened, I spoke with a fellow general today, a guy that used to be a colonel, and uh, he made general under my command, and now he retired three-star. We were talking about a couple issues today that's facing the Army that he and I are going to put some notes together and send to the Army. And in, 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 in my time in the Army, that was valued advice from the retired corps. Whether you call them or they call you. I think the emeritus uh, staff, history does have a place uh, of where we're going in the future because we've got the forthright experience of seeing Similar mistakes under different conditions happened in the past. Sometimes we cower to our fears and we are worried about failure and not living on the edge, forcing success. Did that make sense? Yes, sir, it does. It does. So uh, at this point, General, we want to just show and appreciate you for your wisdom, for your authenticity your strategy, your candor, your uh, straightforwardness, and just being quite frank with us. We appreciate all of the wisdom that you've just imparted to us in the last hour and a half. And then more importantly, General, thank you for your service and your years of frontline experience. We will harness all of the information that you've imparted to us tonight, and we'll use it 
in our classrooms, in our boardrooms, in our organizations, throughout this world, because we know that it takes a leader to know a leader, to grow a leader, to show a leader. And we appreciate the wisdom that you've imparted to each and every one of us tonight. And again, we want to thank our virtual audience for joining us tonight. You guys have just been there with us throughout this entire duration in this virtual space, getting the slide deck up, getting them down. Uh, we appreciate you. And it says a lot about who you are as a leader. And that speaks to the direction that this uh Strategic Leadership Institute is moving towards, you know, we're going to be having symposiums and webinars and seminars and other speaker series and coaching and developmental experiential opportunities and short courses and really helping leaders to be successful because at the end of the day, it's about moving the needle with leadership development. Uh, I want to appreciate Dr. John Butler for joining us. I see he slipped on here. We're going to be hearing from Dr. Butler uh, in November. And each and every one of you want you to come back with us on next week. We'll be having on, on our uh, Zoom call, uh, we'll be having Ambassador James Joseph, and he's going to be speaking to us around uh, exploring moral and ethical leadership, and to a large degree, just kind of how do we balance policy analysis with moral and ethical principles of something that's really missing and we really need to have those crucial conversations in this space. But again, General, we want to appreciate what you've done for us tonight, and we appreciate uh, all of the wisdom, again, that you've imparted to us. And I want to thank, again, uh, Chancellor Pierre, uh, Dean Andrews, Dr. Ash, Chairman Rutledge, and each and every one of our leaders for supporting this forum. Again, leaders modeled the way, and our uh, academic leaders, our board chair, has done a fantastic job of letting others know that leadership is important to the Southern University system, the Southern University Baton Rouge. And we want to encourage our leaders to continually model the way so that our leaders can make a difference at every level within our institutions, at every level within our organizations, so that we can have high-performing organizations similar to Chick-fil-A. Thank you tonight, folks. If there are no further questions, we want to again say thank you. General, the, the, the thank yous are just coming in. Uh, and again, thank each and every one of you for sharing with us tonight and being with us tonight. And we look forward for you joining us back again on next Monday at six o'clock for Dr. I mean, Ambassador James Joseph. Thank you so much. Good night, SSU Nation. Thank you very much, uh, General Honore. Go Jack. Thank you. Thank you, folks. I have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.